A search for mines is conducted by men of the 101st Airborne Division on a small dirt road outside of Tui Hua. Here on the central coastal plain of Vietnam, 376 kilometers northeast of Saigon, American troops are securing a supply route leading from the coast to a new heliport being constructed 10 kilometers beyond Tui Hua. As the mine sweeping detail moves ahead, security patrols scour the area forward, making sure there are no VC. A battalion intelligence officer arrives by chopper to interrogate a captured VC suspect. Found lurking in the brush, this suspect was taken into custody by the security patrols. Now, with the aid of an interpreter, the man is questioned. He will later be taken to headquarters for further interrogation. Meanwhile, artillery units of the 1st Air Cavalry Division, located in the area, begin firing a support mission. The Sky Troopers are beginning a new search-and-destroy mission, deep within the Viet Cong-controlled wilderness country of Phu Yen Province. Some of the worst lowland jungle is located in this sector. To support these operations against the enemy in Phu Yen Province, a new heliport is being constructed by engineers of the 101st Airborne Division. Here, on 7 July, basic construction of strips and pads is being completed. Tank trucks spread Penaprime, a surface conditioner to keep the dust down. Then, a final grading is given the runway. A tractor and grading sled are used for this job. The pads where the helicopters will be parked are surfaced with steel matting. When set in place, each mat is linked one to the other, creating a continuous covering for the entire parking area. When Sunday comes to this raw wilderness area, chaplains fly in to conduct religious services. There are no buildings yet erected, and the altar stands beneath the open sky. But as always, the sermon is a message of inspiration and comfort. In this brief interval, the war against the Viet Cong seems far away. Sunday in Vietnam. The aviation support elements of the U.S. Army in Vietnam are today engaged in a wide variety of duties. The aerial delivery of all types of ammunition to forward areas is one of those missions. Here, as elsewhere in the service, the transfer of supplies from the source to the delivery crews requires paperwork. Another assigned duty is the airlifting of paratroops of the Vietnamese military force. In this instance, Caribou aircraft are used to transport Arvin soldiers on an airborne strike in the Delta region of the 4th Corps area. Over the drop zone, the Arvin troopers jump with drill-like precision. In the Vietnamese conflict, as nowhere else, the employment of air support in the field of logistics has reached an all-time peak of efficiency. Throughout South Vietnam, Army aircraft are providing day and night support to ground forces engaged in hunting down and destroying the Viet Cong. The Air Traffic Control Company whose mission it is to support all Army air activities in Vietnam, has its company headquarters at Tonsonut Air Force Base, Saigon. Here, command functions are exercised over four platoons, each assigned to one of the four Army Corps areas. One platoon supports company headquarters and provides air traffic control for Army aircraft in the Corps area, which includes Saigon. The platoon also is responsible for its communications in the core area, involving telephone, teletypewriter, and radio communications. Here, personnel troubleshoot a newly installed telephone terminal box. 
A repairman checks radio equipment in use in the flight control center and flight operations center vans, which have just been set up in a new location at Tonsonut. A Craig mast antenna is erected to handle traffic from the flight operations center van. Once installed on its base, the Craig mast antenna is elevated to its operating position as platoon personnel man the guy lines. Then, radio teletypewriter circuits are placed in operation to tie the installation to company headquarters. Another U.S. Army unit in the Dominican Republic prepares for departure. Tank Company C, a part of the American Brigade Inter-American Police Force, packs its equipment for the trip back to home base at Fort Stewart, Georgia. Company C arrived in the Dominican Republic in the fall of 1965 and helped in training programs related to infantry operations during the October riot. C Company tanks leave camp in Santo Domingo and head for the marshalling area at the beach for loading onto LSTs. In March of 1966, elements of this unit spent five weeks in Puerto Rico conducting gunnery exercises. The company also carried out demonstrations of its capabilities for Dominican military officials and members of the Inter-American Police Force. At Red Beach, a message of cheer for the departing unit as the LSTs come in to load up. In addition to tanks and personnel carriers, C Company has its own support trucks, trailers, jeeps, and a track vehicle recovery unit. Moving company equipment aboard the LSTs is a two-day operation. Farewell ceremonies include a send-off by an army band. On hand for the departure is Brigadier General Robert Linville, Commanding General of U.S. Forces in the Dominican Republic. The main body of troops goes by air, and the general participates in another departure ceremony at San Isidro Airport. Awards are given by General Linville for outstanding service in the Dominican crisis. A delegation of Inter-American Police Force representatives takes part in the farewells. Between their regular assignments, the men of Company C found time to engage in civic action projects in Santo Domingo. The unit supported a school for needy girls and was instrumental in obtaining donations for the project from U.S. civic organizations and religious groups. Now, for the men of the armor company, it's adios amigos as the big C-130 transports take off for stateside. In Heidelberg, Germany, at headquarters of the United States Army Europe on 20 July, a ceremony is held to honor the commander of the Northern Army Group, General Sir John W. Hackett. He's accompanied by General Andrew P. O'Meara, the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Army Europe. A VIP audience looks on as General Hackett receives a 17-gun salute. The honor guard is from the 529th MP Company. The guard marches to the music of the headquarters band. General Hackett expresses his desire to meet some of the spectators in the visitors gallery. These include members of the general staff of headquarters, U.S. Army Europe. 
as well as their ladies. General Hackett is joined, when he leaves, by Lady Hackett and daughter Mary. The general is now bound for briefings here at Heidelberg and then at the Central Army Group Headquarters at Seckenheim. Championships at Wiesbaden Freudenberg, Germany, scheduled from the 14th to the 23rd of July. More than 1,000 participants try for awards in rifle, pistol, and trap shooting in the largest such contest ever to be held. United States contestants are winning more than their share of medals in this 39th annual contest. Army Captain Donald Adams and Lieutenant Gary Anderson place first and second in small bore prone and standing positions. And with Captain John Foster and William Krilling win gold medals as a team. As the matches continue, Lieutenant Margaret Thompson wins the women's individual small bore championship. On another range, the matches for the center fire pistol are being held. Sergeant First Class William Blankenship places first with his individual pistol score and joined by Air Force Captain Franklin Green, Sergeant John Dittmore, and Army Staff Sergeant Emil Hoygater capture the team trophy. Airman First Class Kenneth Jones has top individual score in the Clay Pigeon event. Jones, Lieutenant Gordon Horner, Charles Jensen, and Captain Franklin Green make up the winning team. John Kingetter of Fort Benning is third in the running boar event. Then he, Army Sergeant Edmund Muller, and Air Force Sergeants Richard Brown and Frederick Dean place second as a team. U.S. Army Berlin plays host to the 6th German-American Volksfest, the open-air carnival which annually helps promote good community relations Welcoming remarks are made by Major General John Franklin, Jr., the U.S. commander in Berlin. General Franklin and Hans Günther Hopp, Berlin Senator for Finance, cut the ribbon, officially opening the fair. This year's Volksfest, tracing the history of Texas's independence from Mexico, draws a record crowd. For West Berliners who live inside the borders of the Iron Curtain, recreation of the Alamo and the heroic stand of its defenders has a special meaning. Various exhibits suggest the early days of the fortress in the 18th century when it was a center of Spanish culture and an important part of Spain's plans for a great Western empire. Members of the Mosaics, a group of handicapped Berliners, demonstrate the arts and crafts taught to the Indians at the Alamo by the Spanish Padres in the 1700s. A message to the Volksfest from Texas Governor Connolly recalls the sacrifice of two native Germans in the siege of the Alamo. The Berlin Old Texas Cowboy Club holds guard mount at the replica of the fortress. Though the demonstrations are in keeping with carnival gaiety, Berliners become familiar with some of the costumes and customs of the early American West. U.S. soldiers in Berlin foster a spirit of understanding with the people in the area. The Volksfest contributes to this understanding 
with its enactment of a dramatic incident in the American heritage.